Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Optimizing Your CRO Selection Process for Pharmaceutical Drug Discovery. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. The webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. The chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank KCAS who developed the content for this presentation. With over four decades of providing bioanalytical services to pharma and biotech industries, KCAS has the leadership, business model, strategy, depth of experience, staff development plan, capacity forecast system, proactive resource acquisition, and the prioritization process that makes them a reliable partner and viable partner for your discovery needs. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Dr. Habibi Gudarzi joined KCAS in May of 2018 as the Director of Discovery Bioanalytical Research. He earned his PhD from Purdue University and conducted postdoctoral research at Oak Ridge National Laboratories and Cornell University. This was followed by 22 years of experience in mass spectrometry-based research and development that included instrumentation, automation, fundamentals of MS slash MS, and analytical and bioanalytical applications. His extensive experience has spanned both industry and academia, with 24 peer-reviewed publications and authorship of successfully funded internal and external research proposals. He was a major contributor to an NSF propo proposal and the principal investigator of an NIH grant. John R. Perkins is the senior scientific advisor who has a focus on LCMS technologies at KCAS. He previously was at Q2 Solutions and the legacy companies for over 24 years, working in quantitative LCMS, principally with small molecules. His primary focus was on validation and sample analysis processes, as well as managing customer relationships in Ithaca, New York. More recently, he was responsible for the bioanalytical lab in Aust, the Netherlands. John received his PhD in supercritical fluid chromatography slash mass spectrometry from the University of Wales, Cardiff, College in the UK. He did postdoctoral research on nanoscale separation techniques with mass spectrometry at the NIEHS in the Research Triangle Park in the US. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the presentation over to John. John, you may begin when ready. Hello everyone, um, thank you for calling in to the latest in the series of KCS webinars. Um, I'm John Perkins, Senior Scientific Advisor at KCS, and I'm here with Habibi Gadarzi, who heads our discovery team. And we'd like to talk to you about optimizing your CRO selection process for pharmaceutical drug discovery. When it comes to outsourcing, what we've seen over the last however many years is that outsourcing is increasingly become a critical component of the pharmaceutical industry r and strategy. Um, we've, we've noticed that CROs have, have transitioned from, a pair, from being a pair of hands who are called in occasionally to actual development partners to help move products forward. Um, it actually allows uh, pharma companies and biotechs to build on their internal capabilities and this in turn helps move research products forward quicker and ultimately to approval. Um, over the years, we found that as as the um, as com as drug development has has dealt with a lot of the more readily treatable diseases, um, when we've moved from small molecule to large molecule therapeutics, the scientific challenges associated with bioanalysis have increased significantly. And not only and where we were used to mainly working in plasma, increasingly we're seeing the need to address complex matrices such as tissue, tears, other um, limited um, volume fluids that, that have become integral to, to, to projects as we 
we're looking at you know, more and more at, at targeted um, drugs to to address um, unmet needs. Sorry. Um, so when it comes to um, assessing a CRO for discovery support, it really follows what we see with um, assessing for development support. Um, we, if you're a typical assessment, divides into two buckets. You, there'll be the assessment of new vendors based on, well, how much is it going to cost? Um, what do you see as their competency, which really is all based on a, maybe a single visit to the site or some phone calls? Um, what do you hear about their reputation for meeting timelines? And then you'll follow up your, your impressions with a quality audit so your, your internal QA can give their assessment of, of how that, that um, company looks. Once you've actually worked with a vendor, um, you're, you're really, again, budget will play into it because most of us, most providers will be working with multiple vendors. But you're, you're then looking at the ongoing competency because you've got an idea of how they work. And there might be issues that you've seen, but those issues may be l l less enough that you don't really want to jump to a new vendor. Then you have the record of, of being able to judge them on their ability to meet timelines and then the quality of the product that they produce. <clears throat> but when it comes down to CRO selection process, we will throw our hands up and say, actually, all the CROs are going to tell you the same things. We all make the same core claims about what we have in terms of resources. Our science is good. We have a skilled team of scientists. We, you can rely on us for quick turnaround times. We build customer satisfaction and trust. We have state-of-the-art equipment and facilities and we'll meet your deadlines. You, you, in part of the assessment process, to a large extent, you may have to take that on trust. But there are actually additional questions that you should be asking your CRO that, that really get behind this and say, how are you going to make good on these promises? For example, how do they manage their overall demand versus execution? What's their scheduling system? How do they, how do they, how do they manage to deal with um, rapid changes in, in 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 resource needs. You know, if if you know a project, for example, rapidly increases in terms of, of what what it needs is what is needed for support. Um, do they describe the process in terms of what do we what do we do to meet the, this additional bolus of work? Who's responsible for driving it? Um, what tools does the CRO use to manage this ongoing process? And then what metrics or reporting dashboards can the CRO share to show you how, how they're controlling the workflow, what they're doing to meet sudden changes in workflow, and, and how they stay on top of it all. So in today's drug development, clients need more, more and more when you talk to them, they're focused on reduced lead times. They want flexibility in terms of project support. They want to know there's capacity available. Um, they want to know there's good equipment and facilities to support their projects. And uh, I, another key question is, what is the on-site expertise and what's the retention of employees? So can we guarantee low turnover? Um, this, these questions are what KCS uses to feed our forecasting process, knowing Knowing what the customer needs, we use the forecasting process to really then get a handle on the scope of our clients' demands. So we're constantly assessed projects that come in, uh, the timing of those projects, and what the what the resource needs are for those projects as as they're moving forward. We then put, have business systems in place, um, which allows us to move resources or increase resources um, ahead of time of those projects when they're going to hit. Um, so this focus on our ongoing hiring, assessment of e current equipment and what our current equipment needs are, and then any facility um, alterations that need to be made in, in terms of a specialised project. And in addition to that, we focus it on training ahead of time, and we'll focus more on this later in the presentation. We're, we we want to, by assessing demand ahead of time, we train people ahead of time. So we're not teaching people um, while they're trying actively supporting projects. The, they will have the tra training they need in place before they touch your samples or your development or your validation. 
and we the, the the forecasting also ensures that we have the appropriate resources and planning in place to reduce stress and turnover so that you, you're building we're building internal team experience such that the net result is improved quality and timeliness for your projects i'm sorry so what to assess for discovery support as, as again as additional questions as, as, as if you're looking at a new lab in terms of business strategy does your management view discovery as a critical function with bioanalysis you know for our understanding is discovery is a critical part of the of the drug development spectrum but you know it's but it's, it's critical to know that your discovery support is being handled by a team who are focused on discovery that is their expertise and they're building a knowledge set around that it's not you're you, you're not working with a group who whose focus lies elsewhere and when a discovery state project comes in they shift resources but once the once the discovery project's done they shift back to their other um the other other tasks um, we want to know that there are dedicated resources in place to drive growth strategy Again, it's that having that re that dedicated team um, that you that you build on to to build for the long term for 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 discovery support. Um, in terms of your the discovery group you're looking at, what's the leadership experience? What's the what's what have they dealt with in terms of analytes, matrices, uh, you, all those all those additional challenges that you'll see with discovery, knowing that there's also likely to be a rapid turnaround associated with that. I mean, what's their experience with matrices beyond plasma? Um, wh when it comes to tissue analysis, what tissues have they dealt with? Um, is, have they just dealt with soft tissue? Um, have they dealt with high fat? Have they dealt with hard tissues? Um, one of our experiences with, is with fingernails. So how did, what's their strategy for dealing with these really, these tough, tougher problems? Again, key to discovery, what's the flexibility within the group to meet projects and customers' needs? Um, do they have a tiered approach to discovery? Because not all discovery projects are the same. Um, we, we have a, 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 an approach that we take and it, it, we, we discuss similar things with customers where you have a, a very quick and dirty as your basic approach where it's just a calibration curve, no QCs, you just want rapid readout so you can then make a, a decision to go on to the next stage. But then we have additional levels of discovery where we start building more qualification into the into the assessment so our, our rga2 which we which is our research grade assay 2 builds in qcs it has a qualification ahead of time before we do samples and then the rga3 is is building more almost close to like a glp type approach <clears throat> but also you need to ask the discovery scientists do they understand that the answers needed from the study actually drives the scientific rigor you don't want to have everything being approached the same way we don't for example we don't need to build a rolls royce for something where all we need is a is a is a, a trabant to get us to where we need to be um also within discovery focus on project timelines is critical um we, we it's that ability to turn things around rapidly is is absolutely crucial for you to make the decision to, make, to move on to your next your next part of the project again what to further to further assess a, a discovery team what do you see as the depth of experience within the team is it is the group again pointing to the fact that they've got qualified personnel who understand that that need for the balance between quality and science um, again coming back to the fact that you don't need to have a, a really robust assay when all you want is a is a simple answer to meet a, a very a, a simple question very quickly um, also you want to know that the the we have a long-term strategy towards discovery you don't just use discovery as an entry level group to feed the regulated teams so where they come into discovery and learn basic and basic extraction like protein precipitation how to run an instrument and then think think in terms of them moving on to other groups to learn more um, as they support more regulated science that's not what you need within a discovery team it's important to have this group who have a, a true understanding of what discovery needs are in terms of infrastructure, you want to know there's capacity. Um, we would also recommend a thorough preventative maintenance program. Um, the, you, although 
discovery may only want uh, they may have you may have wider criteria um, but you still want to know that you can stand behind the data as they as they appear you need to know that the instruments have been re reliably serviced and you can vouch for the data that, that is being provided to you and also you want to know what what's the group doing in terms of automation um, what can they do what where's their focus in terms of improving processes and what they can do in terms of, of building those rapid turnaround times um, on a staff basis what what's what's in place for for training programs in terms of staff development um, what what's being done to grow the individuals within the team so they're not just in a role and stuck there forever but what are we doing to actually actually build their experience for the longer term um, and also then ask also what's the capacity forecast system and what's the plan for acquiring resources for the longer term so we have a poll question here so i'll hand it back to ryan yes thank you very much so the poll question that audience members uh, see in front of them right now you can interact with this in real time you can vote by clicking on any of the answers question asks what is your approach to discovery work your answer options are support all discovery studies in-house support rapid turnaround studies in-house but outsource more complex studies such as tissue work uh, your preference is to outsource work to a single provider or prefer to work with experts bioanalysis and in life are not tied together your question once more is what is your approach to discovery work so please take a moment right now to just go ahead and click on the answer that is most suitable for yourself or perhaps if you've got a group of your colleagues with you in the room right now uh, keeping social distancing naturally, go ahead and uh, answer as appropriate. Looks like we've got quite a few answers, but we're gonna give it a few more seconds. All right, let's take a look and see how everyone has voted. All right, so coming in at 44%, support rapid turnaround in-house, but outsourcing more complex projects. After that, 31% prefer to work with experts, bioanalysis and in-life are not tied together. After that, 19% preferences to outsource work to a single provider and coming in last is support all discovery studies in-house. Thank you so much for your participation. Back to you, John. Thank you, Ryan. So um, in terms of bioanalysis at KCS, here's how we the, the scientific team is set up. We're actually divided into we apply a lot of technologies and are divided into our LCMS teams and then the groups that apply like in binding technologies. Within those those separate groups, they're, they're, the setup is fairly similar. So to focus on LCMS, we have a discovery LCMS team with, and with which Habibi leads and he'll talk more about it, obviously, and with the focuses on non-GLP um, therapeutics and endogenous molecules. We have a regulated LCMS group who are there for the GLP um, part of work looking at validation sample analysis and then we have a biopharma LCMS team where a lot of, they're actually doing similar work to our discovery team with non-GLP large molecules and also endogenous molecules so there's some overlap between the discovery and biopharma teams the, the other part of it is actually by having both the LCMS group and ligand binding groups w within within one facility and all under one roof there is that there's a good flow of information between groups in terms of what we can do optimally to, to support projects and this plays into cross training that Habibi will talk about later so um I did I think I, at this point I need to to pass this over to Habibi all right thank you John uh, let me start with talking about challenges associated with uh, building uh, a team I could easily uh, call that uh, requirements, but essentially uh, these are the type of things that we consider. Uh, number one item, uh, it might be an obvious thing that you have to have resources um, in, in place uh, before any agreement or a contract is signed to be able to meet the timelines. And that goes beyond just knowing uh, what type of projects uh, and how many are coming through, you also have to be able to justify requests for additional instrumentation and additional staff. So you really have to know your your operations to be able to, you know, uh, successfully justify them. So every instrument that, uh, let's talk about instrumentation. So every instrument that comes in the, into the door, 
if um, they're going to be used for non-GLP, they still will be treated as if they were using for you know, GLP type um, projects. So there's no distinction uh, between that. So every instrument goes through an IQ OQ where we pay the vendors to do it. And then we do a, um, a performance qualification that, and we have to get it past our QA unit and they have to uh, approve all that before an instrument can be used. So um, that way uh, you don't have um, really uh, uh, the, you know, the comment about like, uh, you know, quick and dirty. It's like, I don't even let that phrase to be used. It's actually quick, but the data has to be still quality. As John said, you have to be able to stand behind your, uh, your data. You have to be able to defend it. And uh, one way that you do is you start with having a uh, properly uh, installed and qualified instrument. And those instruments are all in the same PM and, um, and calibration schedule, any repairs documented. So it's a full um, documentation on the, uh, on the instrumentation. So what we don't want to have is, you know, have a um, project to be started in discovery and, you know, you plan for success. So you assume that this, at least one of these, uh, let's say novel compounds that you have will move into uh, regulatory work and you don't want to say, you know, to take a step back. You want to be, have a smooth transition into uh, GLP um, uh, platforms. And then the uh, next uh, big item is, you know, hiring people. How do you train them when you get them in place? And uh, yes, you go through an interview process if you're hiring from outside. And, and you have to, when they come in, they go through a full assessment of their capabilities. They have to show that they can produce quality data and a significant amount of time is, uh, is spent, including shadowing other staff that know what to do or, or uh, have been fully trained. And then to be able to uh, then um, demonstrate their capabilities before they're, you know, they're allowed to, um, um, you know, uh, process actual real test samples. One of the things that we have um, is trying to, we have uh, uh, essentially spent a lot of time um, on our core training. What modules do we need to have to really build and train our staff? And also what do we do for future in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, the, um, how they expand their expertise. Everybody comes with a set, but as the you know world changes and you're you know you're um, expanding uh, uh, and you can't uh, afford to always um, depend on bringing expertise in, you know, so you have to have a process that you also build the expertise in house as well when you know time allows, etc. Um, so and uh, you know the added um, requirement or the reason for all of this is in, in discovery is even you know, uh, stronger because the timelines are very rapid. Uh, so uh, we expect to get started as soon as a contract is signed and we need to have the instrumentation and staff in place uh, to be able to do that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. All right, so um, one of the strategies that we, uh, we uh, use is a phrase that we use all the time, powder the report. Every single staff member in the discovery team will be trained uh, to be able to do the whole project. You know, some groups may be siloed in terms of, um, you know, extraction versus method development and separation or uh, the mass spectrometry portion. Um, but in, uh, in discovery, every single staff member is trained to be able to go from start to finish. So the common thread behind all of this is we don't want to create any um, any bottlenecks. And the way you do that is you prevent it from being formed. And uh, so all those different steps uh, are uh, uh, people have to start somewhere. But at some point, expectation for every single person, regardless of their uh, job grade is that they will be trained for the whole thing. Um, and the benefits of that will be that it's effectively you're building flexibility into your team. Um, you don't have silos. People don't have to wait on anybody else to complete a project. So every staff member can be assigned uh, 
to a project and they are responsible for you know uh, doing uh, performing the whole um, project and they're responsible for pulling in resources if there are areas that they you know they might need help with uh, junior staff and we noticed this uh, we've done this and we we have you know uh, historical data that we can say that really takes the junior staff uh, in, you know, makes them engaged and they're excited about learning and as a matter of fact good old days where we could have in-person meetings the first question I would ask the team uh, have you learned anything new this week and and uh, and when I asked them go ahead and describe what they learned and I could see the excitement when they were describing what they learned and the senior staff you leverage them so they will be able to you know coach and help troubleshoot and uh, and you know push uh, projects through and help uh, you know get over those um, unexpected obstacles and so the senior staff is even you know excited about that they get to exercise their leadership essentially be able to uh, train other people train up so we, we use uh, that phrase uh, you know uh, a lot um, and the productivity you know really goes up because effectively you don't have any time wasted to for example waiting for for somebody to be available to analyze your samples you could do it yourself you can go from start to finish without needing really anybody else next slide please So uh, the, we know that one of the things that happens in our business all the time is um, things can change rapidly. We often get um, uh, requests for pulling timelines up and making it you know, sooner than expected. And uh, the way you can do that is to have a, um, you know, the, you know, what I already said about the training program, the development program of your entire staff. You cannot have any weak links anywhere. So that takes, um, first of all, the first step is creating a coaching and mentoring culture. That takes time. And, you know, as everybody knows, time is directly associated with money. So it takes, it has a financial implication. And we go through that because we believe in that. And we have a, a process of cross training where a person from uh, let's say the uh, pharma uh, department will go into biopharma and uh, for a minimum of eight weeks at least they'll do the work that they get trained to do the type of work that they do in that department so you cross train them beyond their just immediate you know function and what that does is that uh, allows you to be able to pull from other departments because you have already trained them and the training happens uh, um, to the most part uh, irrespective of you know, the workload in those two areas. Um, so that uh, you increase their scientific skills, knowledge base, and often uh, what they learn uh, from another group, there's a business benefit is that then they can cross-pollinate what they learn in their home group. So when they go back, they talk about, hey, they do it this way, you know, uh, and let's uh, let us adopt that process. So there's a dynamic process that we, those un unintended consequences that people learn something and then they will be able to make better decisions for their for their own work. And uh, the other part of about getting ready for surge in um, expectations is you, you have to have a collaborative forecasting process. It has to include management, business development, operations. Everybody needs to know what is uh, happening in different areas. And we uh, meet frequently and uh, we talk in real time all the time. And if anything unexpected happens uh, you know, with timelines, et cetera, it's communicated. So there's not a, ever a surprise when our, let's say, business development uh, folks are out in the field and they get questions all the time when can you get started they already know what the backlog is they already know what the time to start is so they'll be able to you know from a point of uh, uh, knowledge to be able to to um, uh, discuss those issues like timelines uh, there's again can't emphasize enough a constant internal communication that needs to go you go on 
and including reallocation of resources. I talked about hiring people from uh, external sources and the, taking the time to properly assess their uh, their skill set and train them for our processes. But everybody knows the fastest way is to be able to you know uh, ask for help from a, another group internally. So within the pharma division, for example, um, everybody that is trained on the GLP side can help uh, you know the group in uh, in the non GLP. And we train to that, so there's no surprises in terms of how we do things. It's a unified uh, process. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk about, a um, case study where um, one of the scenarios that what happens when, when um, success does happen to take a place. You can go ahead and just display the whole um, slide that we Good. Okay. So one one case study. I'm um, starting on the left side. Uh, it started with a uh, test project, um, small rodent study, just comparing two compounds, wanting to know the PK profile of the uh, of the compounds. And what we observed is in in trying to develop the method for it, uh, the LCM SMS method for it, and extraction, etc. We had some um, uh, scientific challenges, let's call it. Uh, chromatography didn't look as good as the you know, suggested methodology, a starting point was suggested. Uh, a very uh, difficult carryover, trying to uh, remove carryover from sample to sample. And also, um, we, as we communicated the results, et cetera, we realized that yes, this method had, had been, or these compounds have been tested at other places, at other internal external laboratories, and those challenges are not unique to us. They're actually happening in other places. So we worked to remove and solve all of those issues, and we were successful in that. And what that resulted into is, well, you know, additional um, challenges in terms of, okay, you did great here. We want to expand this. We want to now uh, extend or expand the scope and we want to also look at different, um, you know, matrices, for example. And without having that proper training in place, as John said, beyond the uh, uh, plasma, we would not have been able to uh, to provide that service. And we were able to. And uh, in this case, um, you know, we went rapidly from one study, a small study, to medium size to large size studies, and. Uh, nearly 30, maybe more than 30 studies uh, in, uh, inside of about, I would say, six to nine months period. So to be able to pull from uh, resources from other parts of the company at some point, uh, and because we were trying to do things in parallel, was crucial to us being able to meet those timelines. So uh, the outcome, as I said, we were able to use all of our flexibilities, our the the time and, uh, uh, that we spent in cross-training staff and to be able to uh, also develop them to a higher skill set, that meant we have more people that could you know, help and attack the whole um, overall large project and be able to meet the timelines. And um, so initially, the same uh, small team started uh, the project, handled it, but personnel were rapidly pulled in um, and everything that we did up to that point uh, with the cross-training program um, uh, really helped. One of the other things that really helps us is all of our instrumentations are the same uh, platform. So you train <clears throat> people to operate one system, you effectively have trained them to operate all. And so there's no, again, one of those things that goes back to uh, bottlenecks. There's no bottlenecks. It's no like I know how I don't know how to use this instrument. No, all of this you know LCM SMS systems. Once one person gets uh, trained on one, they can operate all of them. So then gives you really flexibility on instrument time. One instrument is not available, you can jump another one. So that also was uh, crucial in us, uh, you know, meeting those timelines and being successful with uh, with that case. Next slide, please. All right. So I think this with this poll question, I'll. Give it uh, control back to Ryan. 
Yes, thank you very much. Our poll question now at this point says, did you hear anything that you had not considered before when selecting a CRO? So as with the last one, you can vote by clicking on the answer, clicking submit. Your answers are yes, several items. Yes, a few items. Yes, at least one item. No, but the information was very useful for justifying my choice in the future. Or no, it's just not the information I expected to hear. Once again, the question that you have in front of you asks, did you hear anything that you had not considered before when selecting a CRO? We'll give you some time to answer appropriately according to yourself and your company. Just a few more seconds. Excellent, looks good. We've got the most of the people have voted. Thank you very much for your participation. Let's take a look and see how that has turned out. So uh, very close for 29% for yes, several items and 35% for yes, a few items. Then after that, 18% for both yes, at least one item and no, but the info was useful for the future choices. And 0% of you said no, that uh, uh, you there was no information that you didn't expect to hear. So thank you so much for your participation. We're going to send this back to you, Habibi. I believe John goes. Uh, yes, the... it's back to me on this one. So as, as Ryan mentioned in the introduction, KCS has been in business for 40 years, but really our focus has been on bioanalytical. And particularly for drug discovery, um, we know that it the being bioanalytical only focus can exclude you from from opportunities. So we have been looking at ways we can increase our breadth of service so that we it, it gives us more access to additional customers and, and hopefully give you a, a more complete service. So we've introduced a strategy to expand beyond bioanalysis to like a, a a similar to full service discovery provision. Um, this this is really what we're looking to do is is collaborate with um, local in life facilities such that we combine our bioanalytical expertise with expertise at other facilities who have been focused on the in life portion and they know that inside out. Um, so we're, we're giving you a full, it's, it's going back to Habibi's powder to report approach. You give us a powder, we can, we can, we can then recommend a, an in-life provider who will dose the animal um, and then we will do the bioanalysis and report back out to you. Uh, so the, our, our, our vision of this is that the customer provides the powder. We can, we can also um, initiate, we can also pull together study design, dosing strategy, anything that would help you in terms of formulating a study um, and so we can take as much of the the planning and work off your hands but i will pass it back to bb as we talk about um the assessment of of in life providers and then a case study okay um all right. So the um, what are the steps that you know we consider when we want to qualify a local provider um, to be our um, um, you know essentially uh, uh, collaborate with us? And um, I think that to be, make sure that we're clear, if you wanted us to uh, handle the in life part of it, we can do that because we have this you know. Uh, vendors in the local area that we, we can uh, we can use. But if you have your preference, then we can go with that too. Um, so the initial step is to just talk about the logistics of uh, our relationship. And um, obviously, they have to be local so that we could interact easily and quickly and be able to uh, uh, deliver samples, for example, by courier, uh, even shipping overnight. That still causes you a day. So we want to be able to, you know, um, make sure that our processes do not slow down, and um, we look at the compatibility of our operations. We want this handoff to be smooth. So one of the things that we did, for example, is uh, to make sure that we all use the same vials. That you're, if you're using automation, you cannot be surprised with something showing up that you haven't worked before. So all that work pre-work needs to be done in the qualification process. 
and uh, the ability to be able to turn around projects quickly, meaning that both operations need to be amenable to uh, rapid turnaround. And skill set of lab staff, and that's one of the key parts. You know, how do you how do you assess the, uh, uh, for example, uh, I know my my staff, I know what their capabilities are. How about if uh, you're trying to work with another uh, laboratory? So uh, next slide, we'll um, I'll talk about that. So what what um, we've done is um, we've taken essentially model studies that we could use for either internal training or we could use it to qualify vendors. So that Clofenac, I think a lot of people know about it. And just to do a rodent uh, study with that, there's plenty of uh, published data. So the data you get, you can cross, you know, compare it to uh, what is expected and what is uh, what is the published results tell you. And a typical um, um, dual study that often is performed as you know, a route of administration through IV or PO, essentially anything that's not an IV, and uh, typically oral garbage. And we want to be able to just exercise the, you know, the, the uh, what is the most uh, used uh, study design. And um, the properties are known. We've published data is available. We know how the compound uh, works and we know you know, the, the method development part of it is all worked out. Um, and one of the other aspects of this drug is it's very fast clearing. So the on the in-life portion, uh, the person who is um, administering the drug and the time points requirements, the first one, for example, is, uh, you know, two minutes post-dose uh, for the IV uh, portion they have to be able to do that and the logistics has to allow that. If they miss that, we obviously will know that's a good part about doing quantitative work. And um, also if uh, uh, it's not delivered properly, um, for example, through a you know, tail vein that uh, often, or it is possible that uh, the tail vein is missed and the drug is not delivered into the vein completely at least, so all of that and the profile that you get of after you do the bioanalytical work, you will be able to, to show that. So the next slide will, uh, yeah, so I decided not to do a logarithmic scale. So the features will be, uh, I can talk about, and you'll see that the first time points, uh, if you miss it, you won't have that uh, data point close to the expected literature value. And also, um, it's very fast clearing. So, you know, as I said, you have to be quick with the, or very uh, right on with the with the uh, time points. Um, and with the IV or PO, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, with the um, profiles, if it's not a true IV, then you will see it in the, for example, the first initial uh, concentrations values would not be near. Uh, where they are now, where they should be with respect to the published results. So that you can learn a lot from just looking at the data, Bioanalytica data, to be able to comment on the quality of the uh, dose administration. Next slide, please. And this is a typical um, uh, PK table. Um, and uh, every client, in my experience, uh, has their own preferences, how the data should be presented. And we can tailor that to any um, any uh, format that you need, and also be able to explain, uh, you know, the uh, features of the data. For example, in the uh, R squared values at the bottom, you see that there's a there's a point that's 0 0.8, and uh, some uh, R SOPs uh, say that 0.8 or above is acceptable, but some clients uh, prefer 0.9 or better, and we can just you know, for example, in that case, the subject two data could be marked as um, as uh, outlier and and remove that. So we'll work with you on that in uh, designing it the way you like to see your data. Next slide, please. All right. So in summary, uh, we talked about covered a lot of different um, uh, areas, and the takeaways is that. At KCAS, discovery is 
um, actually a dedicated group, uh, and we work on the same model as the other uh, areas, uh, uh, namely GLP. Um, so, uh, for example, our documentation is same as theirs, um, and that really helps us to not only um, meet the requirement of rapid turnaround, but we are comfortable that we can defend that data uh, if we needed to. Um, develop, we talked about the, uh, you know, a cross-training program, also uh, uh, technical staff development. There's a full assessment. Every manager does it with their direct reports. And the way we know, you know, whether uh, somebody needs cross-training or training is that we go through all the basics, all the steps of their, what the skill set they need to have will identify the areas that need to be strengthened, the area that needs to be kept and built upon, and also uh, when the opportunity uh, comes, we can um, ask the, you know, uh, the, those people to, um, the staff to uh, cross-train. And within discovery, I believe every single person is cross-trained in at least one of the areas. Uh, most are cross-trained in two or three areas, and uh, we do have a superstar is cross-trained in four. Um, the um, collaboration with the in-life facility, um, it allows us to be able to satisfy our clients that want us to take care of it. They don't want to deal with two laboratories that want us to do, you know, manage that part of it, the in-life portion. The plenty of clients that they they have their own uh, in-life and samples comes from uh, from those facilities to us and we do the biomedical portion of it. But we have, with this uh, qualified vendors that we have, we have that flexibility. You just need to, uh, clients need to tell us, let us know what they expect and we can, you know, have as much of the full uh, uh, focus on, on the entire, they can focus on their portion and we can, you know, focus on the rest of it. So um, that with that, I'd like to end and we can uh, see if there are any questions for us. Yes, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. But before we continue to the Q&A portion of the webinar, I'd like to draw your attention to the handouts module within GoToWebinar control panel. There you'll find documentation provided by our speakers for you to download. Now I'd like to invite our audience to continue to send their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've already received some questions, so I'll get started with those. Our first question asks, how quickly can you move from quote signature to starting work? I can, uh, I can answer that. Uh, the biggest part of coming up with a um, estimate for uh, any request is to know what the scope of work is. So if we have the scope of work already in place, and it's fairly rapid, within a day or two, uh, we can come up with, uh, uh, with the, how much the project will cost. And, um, and so we can also help develop that scope of work. We have technical calls that, that happen. Uh, so uh, overall, it could be a few days, depends on where we are in the stage of uh, developing the scope of work, or it could be very rapid because uh, a lot of the discovery projects are very truncated and we do realize that it has to be fast because you might be having a meeting and all of a sudden an experiment comes up and you want to try out. So it is unlike the clinical studies, for example, that takes months and years, if not years, to uh, plan ahead. So it will be uh, very uh, rapid if the scope of work is developed already. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, can you talk about a typical tissue analysis protocol? Sure, I can feel that one too. Uh, so one of the challenges with when it comes to tissue analysis is, uh, do we have access to blank tissue? So there's two processes involved. If we can come up with a, with a blank tissue, then we can um, purchase that as we purchase any, any, any other material we need. And we go through the, uh, you know, uh, obviously uh, homogenization is part of it. And we will develop the homogenization uh, and extraction process uh, differently than you would do with a, with a um, uh, 
uh, plasma uh, sample. And then if we cannot uh, find a blank tissue, then we can use a surrogate uh, matrix. For example, we homogenize the tissue and then we can spike it into, into say plasma and with a large dilution step where now the matrix of the plasma uh, essentially dominates the overall matrix. So the, you know, the matrix effect is dominated by the plasma matrix and not the tissue. And so that we have two different processes that we can address and it's based on, you know, can we get blank tissue or do we need to use a surrogate, surrogate, uh, uh, surrogate matrix? Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question asks, what if I'm not sure about method or assay parameters? Could you help me with that? Yes. Um, so that comes through in the technical uh, discussions we can have, and anyone can ask for that at any time. And uh, we can walk through, uh, you know, what are the uh, deliveries through deliverables for the for the project. What are the analytical questions or biological questions that you're trying to ask? And then we can design the uh, the experiment uh, with you, and and we able to. Uh, if for example, you have no idea how to you know uh, extract or separate the anal analyte, your reference material from from matrix. We have uh, uh, you know plenty of experience to be able to look at that and suggest that, and before we even get started. And that, that that way you have visibility into into what we're what's what the plan is. So we can go as far as an informal technical talk, or we can even give a um, uh, development plan if, if needed. But discovery work is uh, typically rapid, so uh, most of the, most of the discussions are around uh, you know teleconference and talking about you know, the methodology and what is what is needed. Thank you very much. Our next question says, do I need to have test samples for an assay to be developed? Yeah, test samples are not, uh, are not required. Uh, it helps to uh, test the uh, uh, method, uh, but the process of uh, if the quality control samples are included, that process um, mimics, tries to mimic the actual conditions that the test samples are, uh, are um, collected or handled, and often we have recommendation how that needs to be done. For example, in case of a, uh, an a unstable compound, uh, we will, uh, during the method development, we figure out how to stabilize it, and we have recommendation on how to collect that sample. So the, if you, you, know, you don't have to have samples, uh, but if you do have it and you want us to test it, we can do that. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, what if I have a method, but I don't like it? Can you use it and improve it for me? Sure. Um, that happens uh, more often than, um, than you think. And we can use it as a um, starting point. We can uh, look to see what the method is and Often we can identify the areas that might not uh, might be you know cause of the poor performance, and we can improve that. But we're we're very open to that. As soon as we test it, if we think that based on the data that the method needs to we need to start from scratch and develop uh, a different method, we can we can uh, discuss that, and and or if we can improve it, we can also do that. So all of the above is the answer in terms of. Um, we can start use it as a starting point and then improve it and or um, start from scratch and come up with a method that that is uh, will be uh, strong or robust. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, how do you recommend evaluating the capabilities of a relatively new CRO who offers great expertise but does not have the documented experience of more established CROs? John, would you? want to take that question? I, I will attempt to answer that one. Um, I, I think it's, well, I mean, it, if you've got the personnel, it might be a new CRO, you're, you're going to rely on their history. And really, you want to talk to them about what processes they've applied in the past in a previous position. 
um because chances are that's going to drive how they're um going to operate as as a new operation um I, I think I think that's probably the best way you can do it. I, I, I mean, I, I would I would honestly ask any questions about their processes and how they plan to deliver. Um, it, it, but ultimately, it, it's it's down to previous experience. So that's how we've that's how we've evolved. It's it's previous experience from a number of organisations has come together to really um, hone our um, processes to where we know that what we deliver is, is is a is a is a solid approach to to um scheduling and and delivering uh, our, our own projects thank you very uh, much for that answer oh sorry yeah i can add to that by just referring to the initial slides where we talked about you know the timelines are important having a uh, solid science and skilled scientists they're all important but then there's those other questions, the other areas that need to be explored. So that's you know the, the start of a new relationship can go in that direction as well. Just I have to ask them just well, I suppose it comes, how do you do different things. I suppose it comes down to being like a job interview where you actually ask, give me examples of what you've done in the past um, on a specific question. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question asks, do you support the untargeted discovery analysis to find out the possible targets in a pathological condition? Do you support untargeted proteomics, metabolomics with your current platforms available? Yeah, the untargeted uh, experiments often require um, high resolution or accurate mass measurements, and we don't have that platform. Uh, so the majority of the projects that we have, they're targeted. And uh, we can do quite a bit with the, uh, uh, with the you know, the triple quadruple quad quad systems, the tandem mass spectrometer we do have. Um, some of them are, are um, Q trap instruments where we can, we have a linear trap that we could, we could use for a bunch of different types of uh, untargeted experiments. Um, so we could consider it and we have to look at it and see what exactly it is that that you want to be able to uh, uh, give you a you know assessment whether we can do it or not for example if it's a very uh, dense uh, separation where under any peak there could be you know hundreds of compounds present and if you want a measurement of uh, accurate mass of every single one of those uh, uh, compounds in that in that one peak, uh, then you know that obviously needs a different type of instrument that we don't have, so we will not be able to do that. But there's a lot of targeted, untargeted work that we do, and it really we have to go case by case basis on uh, on those type of projects. And if I can just add to that, we are we are actively discussing um, the possible role of high resolution mass spec within our lab. So it may be something where we will be offering that kind of service in the in the longer term. Well, thank you very much for that answer and all those answers. However, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at KCAS may follow up with you after the webinar, or if you have further questions, you can direct them to the email addresses that are on your screen right now. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. Also, a survey window will be popping up on your screen when you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box, and there you'll be able to view the recording of the event on this page. You can also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording there as well. So, I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Habibi Gudarzi and John Perkins, we hope you found this webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.